anyway, my name is Robbie Adair, and I'm going to be talking about using AI to speed up your WordPress builds, okay? So in other words, how many of you build websites in here? Perfect. All right. Great. Great. Well, then this will be right for you. Um, I'm on, well, you can find me all over social media as Robbie Adair. It's easy to find me. Uh, if you want to tweet, also don't forget that WordCamp Rochester is using WC Rock. In my session, I actually used AI to generate all the images that you're going to see throughout this. And so I also wanted to share with you what I used as my prompts. Because prompts are important, and we'll talk about that more. Because learning how to use a prompt, it will give you what you want. Just like Chris said, AI is very undependable on the results you get. The more you can learn how to use prompts, the better information you're going to get back from AI. So in this one, I said the back of a female web developer. By the way, if I just said web developer, I would have got a male, 100% of the time. So I said a female web developer. Now what's interesting, I had actually done this, um, I don't know, I put this together about six months ago when it was all still in beta, Firefly. And when I did, I specifically said I wanted a female web developer, so I did get females, but all of them were white. They have been doing a, a lot of work trying to improve the results and, and lower the bias of AI. And now if you ask for a female web developer, you get different skin tones. And so this is actually a good. Things are changing it, and it's changing very, very quickly, uh, which I like to see because just like Chris said, <laughs> it all changes very rapidly. So you have to stay on top of it. All right, quickly about myself, because again, I talk long, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. But if you don't know me, if you haven't met me at another conference, because I've been in talking at conferences for years and years, um, my name is Robbie Adair. You can check out my personal website. I call it the redheaded stepchild because I never have time to update it. Um, anyway, so, but I have an agency that I've had for 20 years, uh, and we do a lot of content creation and web application building. And then OS training, which is what I'm here with, as uh, we do web development training. So we have a website where you can just sign up as a member and learn from our video courses, our eBooks. Uh, we also do a lot of white label training for customers too. All right, enough about that. Let's get into what are we gonna talk about in here? We're gonna talk about a brief history on AI. I am not gonna bore you. We are not gonna like go down the rabbit hole and I'm gonna make you memorize dates. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, and then we're going to talk about generating text. And I know we talked about it with Chris in his last one. So I'll definitely give you guys some other uh, angles on stuff. And then also images and backgrounds. So I want to talk a little bit more about using the image creation that you can use. Um, and then some other ways you can use, because you can choose the chat GPTs and bards out there for more than just generate an article for me. You could say, help me write this bit of CSS code, analyze my report. So there's a lot of things we can do. I want to talk about some of those things that we can do. And then some other things that you should consider as you start using AI, things you should keep in mind. And then of course, Q&A, if we have time, I have actually set a timer, so fingers crossed, I'm going to leave some time for you guys. So. My little robot over here, again, was also with Adobe Firefly, and I'm going to talk about why I use Adobe Firefly the most, or Adobe. Um, and that is, this is a robot checking off a list on a clipboard they're holding, and there is a clock on the wall behind them. So, by the way, I, like I told you, I have done this presentation and now, and I regenerated images now that they were out of beta. But honestly, I liked my image that I received in the beta version the, the, the before beta, better than I did this one, but I went ahead and switched it anyway. But I thought that was interesting that I was seeing some changes running the same prompts. I was getting very different results, which is a lot of people are saying that about ChatGPT4 uh, in particular, that they feel like there are some things that they're just not getting the same as they were before, like it's degrading itself sometimes when it's learning, which is interesting. Now, the brief history on AI. This is where I told you, in 1914, I'm not going to read all this for you. I'm really not. What I wanted you to see on this, because I don't want people to be afraid of AI, and there is a lot of fear with AI. Like people are like, it's going to take our jobs and all this. Quite honestly, AI so far has only generated more jobs. We have prompt engineers now that are making a fortune right now. Um, so it is actually only creating more jobs right now. And you can see 1943 is when the first neural network was actually even invented. This has been around a very long time. And then in the 50s, they expanded again. In the 60s is when we actually got the term artificial intelligence. So it's been here. 
You've been using it, you just didn't know it probably, but I can tell you what this became pretty popular 2018, 2020, when we started getting the chat GPT APIs out there. And then of course in 21, when they actually released it as something you could just log in and use, it became very popular. And then all everybody's like, oh my God, AI is like, it's not been there, but it has been there. You've been using it, I promise you. <laughs> you remember him? <laughs> so. Yes, if you've ever used Dragon Speech Recognition, you were using AI. If you remember the, the chess programs, remember he won actually, the, the AI won against the master. Um, and then also things like email filtering, spam filtering. That's, all, that's been AI since like late 80s, early 90s, whatever. You know, I mean, it, this has been around a long time. Some of it was like data mining. That's probably one of the, I would say one of the biggest industries that has used AI over the years that you you might not have been touching it necessarily, but it's been there. So you've been benefiting from it regardless. So Clippy, I asked ChatGPT, was Clippy AI? And it got snarky. I mean, it really did. He was like, well, kind of, kind of a basic AI. But it was really funny because ChatGPT did not want to admit that Clippy was AI, but he was. All right. So what I want to talk about in here though is how can you actually start using AI in your day to day. Okay, so practically, how can you actually start using it? Well, all of you said you work on websites. If you work on customer websites, if you're working on your own website, then all you have to do is blame yourself if you don't get your stuff to yourself. But if you're working on anything else that, that you need content from the client, you need images, you need text, right? You're waiting, you're waiting. And you don't get it from the client. And so then what do you start doing? You're like, well, you know what? I'm gonna start laying this out anyway. And I'm gonna use this image holder, Laura Ipsum. And so you scaffold it all up and you're like, I'm gonna present this to the client. And the client looks at it and goes, no, 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 I wanted it in English. And you're like, oh my gosh, they totally don't get Laura Ipsum. This is not a real language. Um, and so they're just confused. And then image, well, what kind of image are you thinking there? So imagine if instead my client is a cupcake company, right? And they're gonna sell cupcakes on their website. So if I just go and generate, give me a lemon cupcake on a gingham tablecloth, make it look festive. I get a little lemon cupcake. This is not my client's lemon cupcake, but it doesn't matter. It's a cupcake. This they can relate to, right? They can understand that. And then I'm like, give me a short description for the lemon cupcake from a homemade cupcake factory. And so it gives me a short description. Now, you do need to tell your client, this is not your image and this is not your text. This is so that I can show you what this layout is gonna look like and better yet, it gives the client the ability to look at that and go, oh, that's what they need from me. Oh, this is much easier than I thought because I can tell you, a client starts getting just like, like fear in their soul when you ask them for content. They're just like, huh, I don't know. I've never had to describe my cupcakes, right? But if you can start giving them ideas, now they can go in there and they go, well, yeah, mine's not really tangy sweet though. Mine is, you know, lemony sweet, whatever. And so they can go in here and they can start modifying this to fit their own needs. And it takes some of that anxiety off of them and you might even actually get your content faster from them. But at least you didn't hold up layout and design for them. So this gets you moving along on your project. So by the way, this also was uh, generated in Firefly. So this is a web developer growing old while waiting for an email to come in with, from the client. And that is the truth. Now notice I also put claymation style on that. So you can also dictate in your prompts what style of artwork you want back, okay? So I find that that way, let's say for instance, if I wanted to go through and theme this website more, using the same style throughout my prompts as I'm building this content is gonna give me a very nice theme. Because if you think about it, you're gonna, if they send you all these photographs, you're gonna run those photographs through something so you can give them a nice even tone so it all matches throughout anyway. But if you can just use your same style as you're prompting, it's gonna keep you in that same family of look. <clears throat> generating content. So let's talk about generating content. A couple of things, um, and, and Chris showed you some examples, which I love, because you guys were actually seeing, if you haven't used ChatGPT, you were seeing him use ChatGPT. And you put in your prompt, it's gonna spit back some stuff. One thing, um, and he did it once where he said, oh, now take all of that and make it 
funny or do something like that. Remember the benefit because I, the benefit is I can build upon what I've said in chat GPT or Bard before. I don't have to repeat my whole self. I can say, oh, now take that in and shorten it or shorten it. So remember that you have the ability to keep the memory in there. That's the whole beauty of this, right, is we are having a conversation with that AI and it remembers what we've been talking about. But there are some key things that you need to know. You need to say things like short description or you need to use the words in your prompts to get exactly what you're wanting out of ChatGPT or Bard. Um, like how long, like one sentence or a paragraph or for an about page, which is what you see over here. So I asked ChatGPT, you know, write an about page for a custom made cupcake company, yada, yada. And you'll see that it, it wrote it and it just put, you know, put your cu cupcake company name right here. Now, and I will tell you, because this is part of, if you're using ChatGPT, the non-paid version, you have to know that everything that you are using ChatGPT goes back in to train ChatGPT, all right? Which is maybe fine for you. But if you're going to, and this is an about page, it's gonna be public anyway. So this wouldn't matter. I could have actually used the cupcakes, you know, crazy cupcakes company. And I could have used that name in there, but let's say you start using ChatGPT to do some other things for your company, like write internal SOPs or things like that. If it is confidential information, you might want to consider um, paying to have uh, the paid for version of ChatGPT because you can turn off where your conversations become part of the learning model. So just note, if you need to have some confidential information that you're gonna use in there, you might want to do that. Um, the other thing you could do, obviously, is write your own thing, use the API, but if you're using ChatGPT in its uh, online state or in the app, you probably want the pay for one for that. Now, you want to also supply some things. So like this, when I was building this about, I wanted to give it descriptions that I knew about the customer. Right. So I knew that they were, you know, scratch kitchen, homemade, whatever it is, you know, family owned, second generation, whatever things you might know, throw those in there. Now, again, am I going to use this for their about page? No. And I want to tell the client they are not using it for their about page. I want them, though, to look at this and now go, oh, OK, I can now modify this. And again, you're taking the anxiety off the client. You're helping them. They're actually happy with these kind of uh, helps and prompts themselves because it saves them the time of having to, you know, they're have a meeting with everybody else and go, well, what do we think about our company? Let's write this or whatever. And they just want to make cupcakes, right? So they don't want to make a website, but you do have to have this information from them. So this will help you speed up the process with the client and kind of guide the client as you're doing this. <clears throat> The other thing you can do is you could say to the client, hey, do you have brochure content? Do you have um, bios that you've written for people? All of whatever content you can send me. It doesn't matter what it was written for. Send it to me because I will say AI is extremely fast at taking that content and summarizing it for you, right? It's not having to come up with this information. You've given it the real information. So you don't have to worry about hallucinations here. You've given it the information, you're just saying, summarize this, make a bullet list, whatever. And it's taking your real data then and putting it in a different fashion for you. And so that's a great way to use it. And that actually then is usable content for you probably. You're still going to want to mold it a little bit, to, you know, change some things so that it matches the whole voice of the website, um, which we'll talk about voice in just a minute. <clears throat> you can also have it calculate things. like. If you know the date that they started their company, you can ask ChatGPT, well, how old is this company? You can do that math too, but it'll come down days old is this company, how many hours or whatever. But it's gonna give you a very accurate count on how old it is. So you can say, you know, 13 and a half years ago, and it did the math for you. You didn't have to do the math for it. And there's some other things too that you might use ChatGPT on math. I just actually recently, when I was doing a proposal and I was trying to estimate time on something, ChatGPT is pretty good at estimating time. Like we needed to go through some database records and there was a few thousand of them and some of them we could do programmatically, but some we needed to do manual touches on. So I asked ChatGPT, how long would it take us to manually go through this many, this many columns of data with this many records? 
you know, and, and it was very good. It's very logical about it. It did, you know, give you stipulations of, well, it depends on how complex the data is that they have to check and all this, but here's the average. And so, and it gave me an average. And so that helped me with doing my proposal. So you might also consider that it's very good at, at estimating how long it'll take you to write blog posts or articles. So if you're trying to use that in your proposal, that will be good. Now, this was what I said <clears throat> in ChatGPT. And this is what I got. I also, at the end, I'm going to close. Well, actually, let's just do that now in case I'm running out of time at the end. Bard I also had uh, do this as well. So this is Bard's. And it's a little more detailed, quite honestly. And I actually kind of like the way that it broke it up with headlines in there. So two different answers from both of these. But, but, and I might take a hodgepodge of these too, right? I might take a little bit of this one because I like the way it broke it up. But I might have taken the guts from the chat GPT because I just like the way that it said things in there. So um, I, I recommend that you use both and try both of these. Trying the same prompt in both will give you totally different answers. So that's kind of a good thing in a way because that also means that everyone else is probably getting different answers too. We're not all replicating ourselves, right? So, uh, what did I do with my uh, presentation now? Oh, there it is. All right, let's go back here. Images. Let's talk about images for a minute because there's OpenAI, Dolly, and MidJourney. I think the image that Chris showed probably was a MidJourney. It had a very MidJourney look to it. Um, they, they, they all kind of have their looks, I feel like. But uh, Midjourney especially, there's just a look to the images from it. Um, OpenAI Dali, by the way, this little version they put out was pretty amazing uh, with some of the features that they have out. And so you might want to check that one out. Now, what I don't know about Dali or Midjourney, they're still trying to determine their whole copyright issues, which is why I typically tend to tend over to the Adobe products because Adobe they trained their model from their own stock that they know they control the copyrights on all of this. They actually allow their artists to opt out if they don't want theirs to be included in the learning model. So they are actually about their artist. They are marking their images that have been generated with AI with metadata on them now. And most, most importantly, especially for all of you that if you're doing this as a career, you're building websites for clients, Adobe has officially said they will represent you in court if you get a suit. So, hey, <laughs> I was like, that's good. I, we're kind of an Adobe house anyway, because we do a lot of video editing and things too. And by the way, they have AI tools throughout their whole suite that are amazing what all you can do with it. Um, so this is just an example of some of the things you could do though for our project that we've got going here, right? So they've got inside of the Adobe tools, you've got a text. And by the way, you can do this online. You can you can do Firefly online and have these tools. Or if you have the Adobe products, most of them right now, I think in the, the live version, you don't even have to get the beta version right now. In the live version, they have these AI tools in them. So like this is, I can pick a, a font, I can type a word, and then I can give it a text prompt to say what I would like that word to look like. Cover it in icing like a cupcake, which is what I did here. Okay, so this is cupcake icing on the word cupcakes using a certain font. And so you can change the font, you can say what you want it to be covered in, and then you, just like any other image, you can just keep regenerating if you didn't like the pattern that it used or whatever, you can keep generating. Some other things, I don't know, I'm sure you've had to do this over the years. Client wants a repeating background. Oh my gosh, it's such a pain. You gotta go in there and you like chop it, flip it, flip it, flip it, whatever, to make sure you got this perfect repeating. And then you put it on there and you're like, well, that doesn't look great. So you have to go back in and there's a lot of editing sometimes involved in trying to get the perfect repeatable background. Guess what? You could just say, I would like a perfectly repeatable background of cupcakes. It gave me four options. I could tell, oh, I'd like bigger cupcakes or more random or I want these colors. I'm not having to manipulate an image every time I do this. And so for background generation, it's pretty slick. I like it. Um, and what was the other thing I was going to tell you? Oh, the other thing is that the cool thing about this is you can also, let's say I need an image that's going to be a square image across the text. I can go in there and dictate and say, I need an image that's square of a female web developer at a whatever, you know, and so I can actually dictate the size I'm going to get. 
then I could say, oh, no, I need a hero image. So I need a Y that's X number of pixels by X number of pixels, and it's going to give me exactly what I asked for. Or maybe your client has given you, here's this picture of our cupcake. Can you put it at the top? And you're like, well, that's not going to fit exactly. Well, now you have generative fill. So you can take that cupcake. If you go into mid-journey, you just pull it out wider. It does. If you go into Photoshop, you want to do a little grip on it and generate fill for those. But you can make then an image that fits in the area that they wanted in with their image, even though their image was not the right dimensions, without you having to do some crazy compositing and all that. You just use generate fill or generative fill. Um, that's just the text with icing. And then this was make a perfectly, by the way, say perfectly repeatable. If you just say repeatable, guess what? It's not perfect. I tested it. But if you tell it to be perfect, it will. <laughs> if only I worked that way. <laughs> Cutting out images. Now, for some, I mean, we have uh, Photoshop, like I said. So I, for us, we don't have to use any other tool for cutting out images. But I see a lot of more web developers, or maybe it's a, a coder who now has to do something. He has to do some, he or she has to do some work too. And so they don't want Photoshop, but they need to do things like maybe they're setting up the, the, the staff page on this website. And they want to have everybody, well, I love this, in this pose cut out, you know, and then on a banner of their name. Th I see this all the time. It makes me crazy. But anyway, but so, and, and what do they get? They get, you know, here's a picture of Sue by the fridge, and here's John by the Christmas tree. And so you want to cut them all out. So you can use some tools online. Segment Anything, which is a Microsoft or Meta tool. Meta, thank you. Oh, I did say it. Good. It's a Meta. <laughs> thank you. I was like, wait, it's one of the two big guys. Uh, so it's one of this tool and you tools and you can use it for free on there and you just literally upload your image and you just highlight over the image and it just like it's amazing actually like you'll have like where there's like horses running and like there's a leg of another horse over this one but when you roll over this horse it finds even the little pieces of his leg it's amazing how good it is at detecting the full thing that you want to cut out um, now, over here, I did tell you about Magic Copy, which is a Chrome extension. They also have a Figma extension, I think, um, <clears throat> which is just using Segment Anything. And like this, I just literally, you put it in your, your browser. I went to a, a news article, and, and I said, oh, on this image, I want to use Magic Copy. And then it pulls it up, lets me highlight what I want, which was Taylor Swift, and then, boom, copy and paste into my slide, and I was done. I will tell you though that Magic Copy, <laughs> last time I tried to use it was having some issues. There's a GitHub repository. So I guess he just wasn't updated with the latest changes, but uh, that is where his GitHub is if you want to check it out. It's kind of cool though, because it's just a real fast way to grab images. Even if you just want to use it for your own personal like text people, crazy images, you can do that too. <clears throat> so other things from ChatGPT and or Bard, by the way. They're both pretty good at CSS code work, um, you know, PHP, um, any of your JavaScript flavors. As a matter of fact, one of the things that's really cool about these is you could take, let's say you have some old Moo tools, and you could say, take this Moo tools and convert it to vanilla JavaScript, and it'll rewrite your code for you in vanilla JavaScript. So you can actually use it for converting code between languages or between flavors of languages at least. Um, so that's kind of cool. I don't know if you guys saw the, like two days ago, I think it was, the latest version of ChatGPT. Everybody's losing their minds because, a couple of things, they have now image recognition. So I could take an image and I could upload it. Like there, one of the examples I saw, they, uh, they took a picture of their, their bicycle, uploaded it in ChatGPT and said, how do I adjust the seat on this bicycle? It could but look at that, recognize that bicycle and go, oh, this is a, you know, a trek, mountain bike, whatever. And it has bolts underneath here that you need to do. And it'll do this. It recognized the image. So that's amazing. The other thing that you could do is you could just sketch. And they even showed, they like a whiteboard. Like, here's the kind of widget I would like in, built with PHP. And they uploaded that image and said, please build this with PHP. It loaded wasn't perfect, but it coded something very similar with, a, with the interface looking like that. So it's, it's getting pretty cool. Now, 
is any of it perfect? No, as a matter of fact, like if you use it for doing code, what I always tell people is you do the code and you say, hey, write me a widget that does this in PHP. And it does it and it goes here, there you go. And it would, you run that PHP, you would do it. But ask it, is this the most secure way to write this code? And it's like, oh, you wanted it secure. Wait a minute, let me rewrite this. And it rewrites it and goes, this would be a more secure way to write this code. So again, it's the prompts. You've got to learn how to talk to it to get the best results out of it. Um, <clears throat> as well as um, when you're using it for articles, like Chris was saying, oh, never use this right off the bat because it sounds so mechanical. It sounds like a computer wrote it because it was a computer. But like with ChatGPT4, I could take, let's say I've written five or six blog articles that I have that I wrote myself and I can pop them in and I can say, this was written by Robbie Adair and this was written by Robbie Adair. And so I could give it several examples of my writing. And then I can say, now write a blog post about X in the voice of Robbie Adair. And it's gonna try its hardest to make it sound like me. So we're gonna get a lot of awesomes and things like that in there. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it does a pretty good job and you can definitely tell that it has manipulated the way it gives you that information back. It may not be perfect but maybe it'll be a step closer to make it so that you have to do less editing on this side. And another thing that I wanna bring up about that is the getting it to cite its sources. If it writes an article for you, yes, get it to cite the sources, but you may wanna also go check those sources. I haven't seen a problem with this, but Marcus and I were actually on a panel this week on the AI, and he was saying a friend of his put in some medical stuff, and it's, well, where'd you get this information? It cited a medical journal, but his friend like got the book off and looked it up, went to that page, and went, that's not what it says here. So check the sources, too, when you, when you have it do it. Um, or don't be like the lawyer who said, could you please write my closing uh, arguments? And it had like three or four cases in there that it cited, but it totally made up. Those were not real cases at all. That guy got in a lot of trouble, so don't do that. Um, the other thing that you can do in here is have it scaffold up a plugin for you. And actually, uh, there's a couple of really good YouTube videos out there, if you go search for this, of people who, like, do it live. They'll, like, show you. Have you done it? Just the other day, I did it for the first time. First awesome. Time using awesome. Hey, It's, it's pretty amazing. So Topher actually did do this and it did work. You still will probably want to touch it and change some things about it, but it's pretty good about doing that. Now, the other thing that I find developers, because this happens all the time, you inherit some code, right? Oh my gosh, the worst thing. And so what does every developer go? I'm gonna have to throw that away and rewrite this. That's what every developer says, like every developer on the planet says this. But really, yeah, exactly. But really, take that code, Plop it in chat GPT and say, explain, use that prompt, explain this code to me like a noob. It will break it, in o -B, in o -O -B. it will literally break it down line for line. And it's actually pretty good about even referencing, oh, this is referencing a, I'm going to start making it because I'm a real developer. I'll be like, this is a class object blah 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 and, it, and it'll say where it references it somewhere else right so it's pretty cool and so it might actually save you some time of maybe I didn't have to rewrite it all maybe I actually could use some of this or I could see what it's doing and make the modifications that I need to so definitely try that um, the other thing that I want to point out here is again the CSS that I had it build here it's it teaches as well, right? So it wrote the code for me, but then it explained what it wrote for me. Now, you'll notice that I just said, hey, create rounded corner buttons that are orange or whatever. And it did do it, but if you know CSS, what it just did is it overwrote every button on my website, right? So I had to go back and say, oh, could you make the class, could you give it a class name? This was funny. Could you give it a class name? It literally named it class name, I think. And I was like, wait, could you name it a class, you know, orange button? And then it did it. So it did do, whoo, I'm running on my time here. Uh, so it did do it. But the nice thing about that was I didn't keep having to write out this whole thing of, can you give me an orange button? You know, I just said, oh, now can you change the class name to this? Oh, wait, I also wanted to have a shadow. And it just gives me back the code with the added changes that I wanted in there. And you can save those. So all of your conversations you're having with ChatGPT, 
are saved in there. So I could go back next week, because let's say I send it to the client, and they look at it, and they go, oh, that's great, but I really wish we had purple blitz. Okay, great, whatever. Now I could just go change that purple, but maybe they go, I'd like more rounded, and I would like, you know, one square corner. Okay, so I could just go back in there. I could go, okay, could we up the radius on three corners and make the lower right square? And it will give me that same code back with those changes in it. So it's nice because I didn't have to repeat myself. It's saving those little microseconds of time in your day. It actually adds up to a lot of time in the, in the end. All right, so that was what I said, write CSS to make it. Like I said, I kind of I was like, oh, that was too vague. I should have said with this class name, you know, giving it a little more direction there. So if you're going to start doing this, and I highly recommend you do this, AI is not going anywhere, obviously. All these tools are now incorporating AI. So you're going to start using it. Things to think about whenever you're going to do it. <clears throat> Which, by the way, I asked ChatGPT, what should we be concerned about? And it gave me a long, a extremely long list. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay, let me just find the things I think are really important in here. Quality and coherence. We've talked about that. Double check everything that it, you generate, right? Check it out. Make sure, even if you've asked for references, check it out. I ask it, I asked GPT about uh, you know, gave this whole description about their history. They've been in business for 65, 70 years almost. And it's like, and then the CEO passed away in 2002. I was like, oh, he's still alive, but okay, that's weird. And then I went over to Bard, and I said, you know, tell me the history. And did the same thing, gave me the whole little history, and said the CEO passed away in 2012. I was like, why did they, you know, the passed away when they really have it? So I went back to both of them, and I was like, why do you think the CEO has, is deceased? And both of them went, oh, I don't know. I guess I just made that up. Literally, that was the answer I got back. Because what you do have to know about AI is it's designed to give you an answer. Even if it has to hallucinate an answer, it's going to give you an answer. But the answer, if you ask it the right question, could be, oh, I made that up. I don't know. I don't have a reference. I can't find any reference. Oh, okay. So check everything. Um, plagiarism. Uh, plagiarism is obviously something you want to run your content through a plagiarism checker. Or if you're using something like Grammarly, like Chris had up here, Grammarly will basically, you can use AI in Grammarly, it generates it, then Grammarly runs its own AI to correct it, but then it also runs it through a plagiarism checker. Or you could do this yourself, just run it through a plagiarism checker. There's also things like zero GPT, which is checkers to see if something is generated with AI or not. They're not perfect, just like Chris said, I ran through something that I generated with AI and went, oh, this is you know 97% probably. Well, it was 100% because I just generated and plopped it in there. But it said 97, so that's pretty good. And then I took one of my own blogs that I had written, which was obviously not AI, I threw it in there, and it went, well, there's like a 7% chance or something like that. And I was like, I always knew I was part robot. It's proven now. Zero GPT said it, so I'm good. Um, and you just have to keep up with the legal and regulatory compliances are the hardest because they're changing every day. But if you're going to try and use something, that you know you're going to use, like I said, some of it could just be using in the building process of your website. It's all thrown away anyway. That doesn't matter. But if there is something you're going to in the end use, make sure you can use it. Okay? And they're saying that this is a lack of creativity. I say the total opposite of that. I think that is not true. I think it actually boosts our creativity and it makes us faster. Because just like he showed you, I could I sit down and write down 10 article ideas for a t-shirt or whatever yeah I probably could you know here there's some blogs I could write about it but it, I can go to chat GPT and go give me 10 ideas and it generates 10 ideas like that okay I may or may not use all of those I may use some of those but it still sped up my creative time and I'll probably modify it from there so I find it just sparks creativity versus kills it um, misinformation we know about. Data privacy is a true key, which is what I was telling you about. Have the paid version and don't let it learn if you're putting in confidential information. Um, lock it down. And then over dependency on AI. I can't imagine us being over dependent on any technology. No. Come on, come on, not at all. I mean, it's like I had, like, I probably have looked five times to see if my phone was there. You know what I mean? I can't imagine being over dependent. So what are the, what should we do? <laughs> By the way, so ChatGBT just, you know, wanted to help me. So it just went on to say, and these are some things you could do to, you know, help this anyway. And I'm just like, okay, all the things I said, check your stuff. Stay on top of it. <laughs> That's basically it. 
Um, and this is moving very fast, so do use it. Don't get left behind, do use it. See how you can incorporate it in your day-to-day -day life. By the way, there's a tool called Scribe How. So when I get with the website and then I want to start clients step-by-steps on how to go add a post or add a page or make a change to something, I literally go turn on Scribe How and as I'm doing the actions, it is literally taking a screenshot for me at every little step that I take. It is writing the step-by-step -step instructions for me, and it is dead gum good. When you're done, you say stop. It takes you in there, and you've got this step-by-step -step document that is written for you. You can still modify it, change it, whatever, generate a PDF, send them a, you can generate HTML from it, whatever you want. And that has saved me so much time because it's called Scribe, H-O-W, how, scribehow.com. Mm -hmm. It's great. You guys should check it out. It's amazing. Um, I subscribe to a lot of podcasts. I get um, too long, didn't read emails about AI. And let me tell you what, it's amazing. I probably get 10 new AI tools to review a week. It's crazy how fast this is happening. So definitely get in there and learn. And I actually did make it to my last slide, so I'll be able to answer some questions or show you something if you want. By the way, if you are interested in a, a membership to OS training for you or your clients, by the way, you can use Unleash Me because it's the 20th anniversary of WordPress. That'll get you 20% off. Um, yes. All right. So, and by the way, I will show you guys the Scribe How site just so you can, let's see, there we go. This is it, Scribe How. And so, like, I just create, ooh, I'm not online. Hang on. I know the Wi-Fi blocks everything. It, it. it did, it did. Let me, I'll switch to my phone and see. Here, I'll just switch to my phone, yeah. Maybe. Oh, come on, come on. There it goes. Okay. So, like, for instance, this is how to update something on there. And you can see, it. I literally, as I did it, I was showing the client, I was showing them live, too. And so I just literally turned on record while I was doing it, and it generated this. Now, I know I could risk I do a lot of video. I could record my screen and give them a video, but quite honestly, I give them little videos, but they actually prefer little dots like this. They really do. I mean, because it is, you know, you don't have to play something outside. You don't have to keep just open this up. And to me, it's quite honestly just about as good as the video may be better because then I can give them some little instructions in there if I want. Yes? Is that like a browser extension? Or is it will. It does. I haven't used it on anything else besides browser, but I think it will. Um, I use, like, this is inside of here. You somehow can do it. I think maybe it has a download mod, like a little app you can download it, but I haven't done that. So don't quote me on it. Um, but they also have a little browser plugin. You can see it right there. So I can just start capturing anywhere I am and then start going through it. You can actually combine them too. So, like, if I've done something and then I'm like, oh, page or whatever, then I can put combine those two together and stuff like that. So, um, by the way, I, well, I did show you this with Bard doing the different, it, you do get different, even the, um, the CSS was slightly different because I said rounded corner. I didn't tell it how much rounded. One of them picked like five pixels, the other one picked ten. I don't know why, but that's what they did, right? So, um, you will get, even in CSS, you're going to get some slightly different results. Yes? Uh, <laughs> So, so okay, so notice, because that was one of the things that just came in here, browse with Bing. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, okay, so the question was, where does Bing fall in with all of this? I'm talking about BART, I'm talking about ChatGPT, where does Bing fall in this? Remember, Bing is Microsoft. Microsoft put $4 billion into OpenAI ChatGPT, what do you think they're using? ChatGPT. <laughs> so. Uh, I have not. I have not. So, no, I haven't gone into just Bing's tool. But I think it's just through their search anyway, right? Is the way they're, they're kind of spitting back the AI is through their search. Don't get, I, that I don't know. I haven't seen a particular tool for them. So I think it's just in their search is what they've done. They've incorporated that into their search results, which is cool. And Google's working on that too. Um, and their la the latest Bard actually came out with a checker. That was yesterday, I think. It has a checker in there. So when you generate something now, it's going to pop up and go, would you like me to check and show you the sor site, my sources? So it's kind of helping you remember to do that. So, uh huh. Uh, kind of um, very related to your topic, uh, Zip AI and other companies that are basically creating websites. 
insights strictly from AI, or at least a, let's call it a, 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 first, a first go, mm -hmm. a first drop. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on where we are in the first, let's call it the next year? Okay. So here's what I will tell you about that. And I have been building websites since HTML 1.0, there was no image tag. I've been doing this a very long time. And I should have not said that. I just dated myself. Whew. Anyway, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll just cut that out of there. That's not true. Um, what I will tell you is there are many ways to build a website, right? And everybody kind of has their own technique and their own flavor in there too. So what I do think is you're going to find people who not who haven't been web developers, this is going to be a cool tool for them. They're going to go in there and go, I want a five-page website, and, da, 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 and they get it. And like, hey, that's great. Because they've never done it any other way. So they don't know if what they've got is great or not, but it was done. And so they think it's great. I do think if you're a web developer and you generate this, you may look at it and go, oh, either that's garbage on the code in the back end, or you may look at it and go, oh, yeah, okay, this is a good start, and now I'm going to start finishing it out. That's what I think about them. I think they're going to be tools that web developers will use to save time if they can get them to generate something that is usable enough for them to go forward with. Um, there, I've watched, I haven't actually tested them myself, but I've watched several demos on some of these builders like you're talking about. And so far, I haven't been super impressed. I mean, it's getting there though, but just like you saw the audio AI six months ago, that audio AI was pretty much garbage too. Six months later, here we are, and I can make Elvis sing Snoop Dogg song, literally. And so it is pretty amazing how fast things are moving. The video stuff, th here's the other thing I will tell you. This is what I think about AI. It, it, use it, but some of these general tools, like just chat GPT, that's pretty general. I can, it could do a whole lot. I, I can ask it a whole lot. I'm in a very big world there. But if you use something like he brought up Yoast if, or Elementor or something like that, where they're narrowing down, and it's already a tool that does a very specific thing, SEO. And then they're saying, I'm going to use ChatGPT's API to just do this little section. They're actually kind of helping you mold prompts, basically. And so I think that's where we're going to see a lot more use out of AI tools is in the tools we already use, but then using them to, to enhance or speed us up just like the Adobe products. I mean, things like um, generative fill. Could we have composited and put a background and made this blend in? Absolutely. But it might have been, to make a really good composite, it might have been a couple of hours on that image. Whereas now, we can do generative fill, generative fill, go, oh, that looks pretty good. Let me just touch up a few little things. Done, and we're done in 15 minutes in something that used to take us two hours. So I'm using AI, but I'm using it in a very specific case, and I'm using it with a skill set that I already have and I understand, and I know if it's good or not, and I know how to improve it. You see what I mean? So I think that's what we're going to see. That's why, just like that, I mean, the scribe how, I mean, I can write, I do this all the time for people, make a screenshot, highlight what I'm showing them, write the step-by-step. Step. I mean, I can do this, but that speeds up my time because it's doing these things for me and then just letting me edit it and get it right the way I want it. Um, video, we're using already things like runway for upscaling. You've got some old video, like we have a client video we're doing for one of them, they're doing a, a conference and we're building a video for them and it's got some history of the company in it, right? And they've got some old, old, I'm talking old video because a hundred year old company and they've got some old video there and it's like this big on a, on a 1080p, right? And so we can use runway though and you can upscale that and you can, you can take a 16 millimeter upscale it to 1080 and it's pretty good i mean it is not perfect but better than definitely just scaling something right which is always going to degrade so upscaling with ai is pretty amazing um the audio i mean yeah making elvis sing snoop dogg is cool and all but really what's good about that is especially if you do a lot of your own recordings and such um you could go into something like descript it you have to say it is your voice. You can't do this with other people's voice. But I can record enough of my voice in there. And then literally, I can just upload a document and say, read this. And it reads it in my voice. And it's kind of eerily good. Like, you're like, wow. Um, the other thing with the speech in AI is for editing. Like, with, when we're looking at our, uh, in Adobe, and you're looking at editing a video, say an interview, you could say, uh, I'd like to remove all the ums out of this. It literally transcribes the text, finds the ums, and it clips them out. And then all of a sudden, your video is shortened like this, and it has cut out those ums for you. It's pretty amazing. 
The other one, I don't know if y'all saw last week, where they have the tool that uh, translates. Like, I can literally video myself here doing this presentation in English, and then I can go make Robbie do this in Spanish. And it not only does it convert my voice over into Spanish, it moves the mouth. So I don't have the, like, you know, I'm going to do, you know, like, little kung fu, like, yeah. I'm going to beat you up, you know, and your mouth then goes, da, 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 da. No, it is, your mouth is trying to move with the language. It's pretty... It's pretty good too. Pretty good. Exactly, exactly. And it's not for a lip reader. I don't think it's perfect though. I really don't. I don't think it's not quite anyway. And they said there's certain languages they're better at. Like, you know, going from English to Spanish is pretty, pretty good. But when you start going to something like um, German, where it's more guttural and you, there's more harsh changes in the lips, then I don't think it does as well. But it will. I guarantee you it will be doing that. Um, so, uh, all right, so we are right at time. Any other questions? Or if not, find me somewhere here. Yes. They have. It is open for commercial use. You, if you're an Adobe Cloud member, you get it for free. If you're not, you can actually now subscribe to Firefly. They just announced this like last week. And it's a very confusing thing about credits, but basically you pay a monthly amount, you get so many credits to use in there, and then as you eat away the credits, you can buy more credits if you want to keep generating. So that's the that's the way that works. I was just going to ask, um, can you recommend the sources for keeping up to date Yes. So do you know the Too Long Didn't Read newsletters that are out there, TDLR? They have one that's specifically for AI. It's amazing. It gives you really good information every week. Um, I like This Week in AI podcast. It gets really geeky, nerdy, and it's pretty long, but it's really good. <laughs> it's really, they might sometimes, it's like, you might want to go to sleep when they start really getting into large language models, and you're just like, really? Okay, whatever. Uh, but it's interesting. Most importantly, uh, I like hearing, like, I like hearing what the geeky guys are talking about and women are talking about in this world because then I kind of lets me kind of have a hint at where we're going with things. Another one I like is AI. I think it's AI in business is what it's called. And he like interviews a different uh, corporate, large corporation people. He interviews them to talk about how they're using AI to speed up things inside of their corporations. Like I knew before, um, before it happened, I knew that my hotels.com was going to be uh, being merged into one key or whatever they call it now with Expedia and all that because I listened to the, the woman that was the project manager lead on that, how they had to take all these different databases from you know hotels.com and Expedia and all that and they had to figure out a way that they're going to merge all this data into one. They use a lot of AI because remember data mining, data merging, all of this stuff, it's right up AI's alley, right? So it can look at it and go, well, you have this, these columns here, you have these, this is probably a crossover here. And I mean, you're still going to have to, you're still going to need the data analysts in there to like say, yes, this is true. But it's just so how fast that AI can work, it can just speed them up. And so by, I listened to her old talk about that, so I knew that was coming. So I wasn't surprised when I got the email that was like, oh, your hotel.com is now in one key or whatever. I was like, oh, that's cool, because I heard her talk about it. Um, so I think, too, you know, and, and there's a lot of podcasts. So just look at the podcasts that are out there, because, you know, I, you can really hear some cool stuff that's coming. One more thing that I've meant to tell you guys about, especially just still in that building websites. Um, if you have some errors that are happening, and uh, you probably get this from your host all the time, look in the logs. I hate that answer. I hate that answer all the time because then you get the log file and it's just like long text file and you're like, I've got to try and find the date and time that something odd happened in this. It would take me a long time to go through and do it. I could do it, but it's going to take me a long time. You can literally dump that log file into ChatGPT and say, find the anomalies. Done. So think about it for those kind of things. Debugging, things like that. So, all right. Again, if you all have any other questions, find me. Thank you.